as we visited this morning, that became very clear that our problems were somewhat parallel. And so I'd like to introduce to you at this time W.C. Bennett, who is president, national president, of the Independent Bankers Association. W.C. Thank you very much. It is a distinct pleasure for me to speak to this annual meeting of your National Farmers Organization. I thank you so much for the invitation. I come to you today as your natural friend. Your organization and the Independent Bankers Association of America, which I represent, share many similar goals and concerns. I believe that the foundation of our similarity of purpose is that both our memberships, both the family farmer and the independent banker, are struggling to serve our communities as local businessmen in an era of business mergers and economic concentration. You represent tens of thousands of independent farm families who must compete with corporations and absentee owners of land, many of whom lack the family farmer's heritage and dedication to conserving the soil and serving the needs of the local community. IBAA represents about 7,400 community banks who operate in the world of Citicorp and Merrill Lynch, the likes of who aspire to channel local money out of the agriculture communities and to divert these funds into the financing of conglomerate mergers and other projects that are far removed from agriculture and this nation's agricultural enterprises. Contrary to the absentee farmer and the absentee banker or financial firm, both the family farmer and the independent banker truly belong to and are a part of the community in which they live and work. Permit me, if you will, to inject at this point, and this is not in my prepared text, but my experience as a banker for some 33 years, I want to share with you at this time. I shared this belief with a group of bankers Saturday past in the southern Minnesota, western Iowa, and eastern South Dakota area. But in my 35 years of banking, I have found that farmers, now I mean the, the true farmer, one who depends upon farm production for his livelihood and the well-being of his family, not the merchant who owns a farm for a tax write-off or for some other purpose. I'm talking about the true farmer and their families are among the best customers of independent banks. While all do not have a degree from an accredited college, they have all been graduated from the School of Hard Knocks and have earned a master's degree in experience. True farmers, as a group, are loyal, honest, religious, courteous, and appreciative. But They will not be pushed, pressured, or shoved around. They work on their own timetable. But let me assure you, as an independent banker, that the true farmer pays his debts. 
I remind bankers as I travel over this great nation to never underestimate or fail to appreciate that guy in the bibbed overalls. He might be the key to his personal successes. The true farmer should not be neglected nor ignored. Even bankers could be hungry without him. Well, back to my text. IBAA member banks are also truly partners with you in the agricultural economy. The greatest dollar value of operating loans for agriculture is made by banks with assets of less than $25 million. Banks of that size make up 80% of our membership. We are concentrated in 18 major agricultural states, many of which are major NFO membership states also. As your partners in the agricultural economy, we are painfully aware that farmers face an increasingly severe cash economic squeeze. The United States Department of Agriculture is now projecting a third consecutive year of falling net cash farm income, with 1982 farm income expected to be even lower than the 19 billion expected in 1981. If these projections actually materialize, and if the farm real estate market remains sluggish, we could see a rash of farm delinquencies and defaults in the months ahead. I know that your operating expenses have spiraled upward in recent years. Statistics show that farm operating expenses during the four years 1977 through 1980 increased 63% from $57.6 billion in 1977 to $93.8 billion last year. Interest rates have outpaced most other costs. It cost the corn farmer an average $3.15 per acre for interest on credit in 1978 and $6.31 per acre in 1980 which is a 100% increase in interest costs in two short years. The cost price squeeze faced by you as family farmers is certainly not alien to the understanding of community bankers. We too find ourselves in a situation in which our cost of loanable funds move higher and higher while the price of our farm and other small business customers are able to pay credit is limited by the prices which they receive. Despite the higher cost of loanable funds, however, I can assure you that a top priority of the local banker in your community should continue to be to serve your capital needs. We understand that the American economy rests on the keystone of agriculture and that the family farmer is the strength of this country's agriculture. We also believe that public policy must assure the continued existence and vitality of the family farm. Agricultural prices must be kept in relative balance with other segments of the economy. To support these goals, the IBAA testified in March of this year before both the House and Senate Agriculture Committees on the new four-year farm bill. During the ensuing months, we have worked closely with your own representatives in Washington in trying to get the strongest bill possible for you as farmers. IBAA staffed up this cooperative effort with you back in January of this year when we hired a Washington office staff person to work full time in concert with the agricultural communities. In our efforts on
the Farm Bill, we especially supported the maintenance of the Commodity Credit Cooperation Price Support Loan Program, which increases in the price support levels which would more adequately corner the farmer's cost of production. We understand, as you do, that the CCC price support underscores the prices which farmers receive in the marketplace and are the most potentially effective means of supporting farm income through public policy. The IBAA also urged the Congress to maintain strong efforts to expand export markets for farm commodities and to give the American farmer free and unhindered access to world markets. We need to develop new markets and new uses for farm products both here at home and throughout the world. This country's public policy should do everything possible to expand the export of farm products at prices which return the maximum dollar to you, our producers. After all, besides feeding and clothing this nation, our farmers are shipping enough food and fiber to the rest of the world to pay about half the total bill for the United States oil imports. The Independent Bankers Association of America continue and will continue to work with you in partnership to secure the best possible federal farm price support and marketing policy. But we have to face the fact that the results may be less than adequate. No doubt, you remain less than satisfied with the Farm Bill, which is slowly taking shape this year. The NFO long recognized and has recognized for some time the need to complement the government's efforts by serving as a bargaining and marketing agent for farmers and livestock producers. You can be justifiably proud of your organization's unique achievements in adding muscle to the agricultural producer in the marketplace. We applaud your efforts and your success in this area. We in the IBAA could not agree with you more that this nation is better served through the joint action in the marketplace by family farmers and other independent businesses where necessary to achieve equitable returns rather than through the mergers of small businesses into business giants with nationwide market power. The Farm Bill was not the only measure on which the NFO and the IBAA worked together this year. We also cooperated in seeing that agriculture was included in the All Savers Bill, which Congress enacted as a part of the tax cut package this past summer. For a while, it appeared that the Congress would tie the proceeds from the tax exempt All Savers Certificate to loans for housing, but not for agriculture, even though the one year certificate is more directly applicable for short term farm production loans than for long-term home mortgages. With the active intervention of your organization and other farm and ranch groups, we persuaded the Congress to include agriculture on par with housing. This clearly could not have been done without our joint coalition effort. Although it is too early to judge the full effect of the All Savers legislation, at a minimum, it will mean that a substantially larger volume of funds will be available through community banks for agricultural lending. Last year, the IBAA worked in concert with the NFO for the passage of the Farm Credit Act Amendments of 1980. We supported provisions of that bill, which should broaden access to the discount window of the federal intermediate credit banks for independent commercial banks who need additional funds for agricultural lending. The discounting provision is still in the process of being implemented, but once in place, it should strengthen the ability of our banks to meet your credit needs 
including enabling banks to make somewhat larger loans to individual farmers and ranchers. Having worked together on a number of important issues during the past year, I believe that an even broader scope of cooperative action is possible and desirable. I'm convinced that more coalition efforts among people who are dedicated to the local community would be useful. In addition to farmers and ranchers and country bankers, such coalitions can include local real estate agents, independent insurance agents, small business organizations, and others. Obviously, the exact composition of the coalition that makes sense will depend upon the specific issue involved. Two issues come to mind on which I believe we could employ a joint effort. First, the issue of interstate banking and the maintenance of the dual banking system. If we are to maintain hundreds of strong community banks in each of our major agricultural states, both federal and state chartered institutions, we need the active assistance of the NFO and the family farm community to help control the appetite of the large bank holding companies for nationwide domination of banking and the elimination of the family farm. We know from experience that the nationwide banking systems that are controlled from Wall Street and other centers will siphon capital out of rural and agricultural areas into whatever uses the centralized bank management deems most profitable to them. We also know that if the large bank holding companies were to take control over funds previously loaned through our local community banks, more of these funds could be used to foster corporate farming and the purchase of farmland by outside corporations funds that should be going into productive farming and ranching operations could be diverted into the acquisition of farms by cooperation, thus contributing to the demise of the independent family farmer. Only through an effective coalition effort will we be able to keep the capital which is generated locally flowing through the community banks whose commitment is firmly with the communities in which they are located. The second issue I would like to call to your attention for possible coalition action is the maintenance of specialized lending institutions in critical areas of credit need. As you know, Secretary Donald Reagan has expressed his general disbelief in specialized lending institutions such as the savings and loans for housing and the Farm Credit Administration for agricultural needs and has called for changes in existing policies which, on which specialized institutions are now based. In a speech in Chicago on September 14 this year, Secretary Reagan said, and I quote, in some ways, specialized financial institutions are like the rookie pitcher who comes up from the minors and mows them all down with his fastball. You can bet that the opposition will have adjusted by next season and our pitcher better have more than just a fastball if he wants to stay in the big leagues, unquote. I believe what Secretary Reagan fails to realize is the fact that many of us are very happy playing in the minor leagues. We're good at it, and we have no ambition to play in the big leagues. Thus far, the administration has built upon Secretary Reagan's baseball expertise to propose eliminating one area of the nation's specialized lending institutions, the housing area. The administration bill, Senate Bill number 1703, would completely remove the Savings and Loan Association and other thrift institutions from their statutory obligation to serve as specialized lenders for housing. This bill is under consideration in the bank, Senate Banking Committee at this time. If it were enacted, 
the thrift industry would not be legally required to make home mortgage loans. Other than for housing, the primary specialized lenders for long-term mortgages in this country are the federal land banks and land bank associations, who of course are committed by law to the financing of farm land mortgages for farmers and ranchers. Does Treasury Secretary Regan have on his agenda a proposal to eliminate this specialized lending for farmland purchases as well? This question may be more than academic, given his general adversity to specialized lending institutions. There's a good chance that this bill to move the thrifts from their obligation for home mortgage lending can be defeated, particularly since it is increasingly recognized that this would not solve the financial problems which many thrifts are currently faced. Your organization, I believe, has a stake in the outcome on this issue. In conclusion, let me return to my general theme. We of IBAA are truly partners in the agricultural economy, and there is no shortage of problems where our interests coincide. Equally important, there is no lack of specific issues and proposals for actions around which we can harness our combined energies for the betterment of our communities. The IBAA welcomes the opportunity to meet our common challenges through a concerted effort. It has been a joy for me to be here. I appreciate your attendance. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. He spent his active service in the Navy and 16 years in the reserve. He's been a college professor teaching American history, and he is presently active in the congressional committee work and works very closely with our office there in Washington. He serves on three subcommittees, livestock and grains, conservation and credit, research and foreign agriculture. And Congressman Fithian, we want to welcome you here to the convention of the National Farmers Organization, and we're anxious to hear what your projections are for the future of this industry and as you read the pulse of Congress. Welcome. Thank you very much, Devon. Thank, thank you, and it's good to be here. What I, what I should say that is that most of my life I spent farming for the enjoyment of it and teaching so that I could afford to farm. <laughs> we, uh, we do a lot of traveling in this business. It's, a, it's been a very interesting, very interesting existence. I just wanted to share a couple of traveling stories with you, and I want to talk a moment or two about the Farm Bill, but principally I want to talk to you today about financing farming and interest rates and what I see down the way because I think that's probably where the rub comes in the main. In the, main. In the uh, Washington National Airport the other day, I, I saw this scene that sort of took me back to the time when our kids were little. I see some of the fellows in here are almost as old as I am, so I know you remember that too. You know how it was when you and your wife and the baby took off for the weekend? It was always about umpteen suitcases and boxes and bottles and what have you. And uh, the, the, the usual complaint is that uh, it looks like we're going for a month. Well, this was clearly the case. This uh, young couple were hustling through the airport. He had one large suitcase in either hand. He had a small one tucked under either arm. He was kind of, as he hurried, they were obviously a little bit late. He was just kind of doing a kind of a fast waddle. She wasn't much better off. She had, in one arm, she had a tiny babe, had, uh, as some of the ladies here know, uh, the arrangement, the, the diaper bag was hooked over the elbow and then the baby was crooked in the elbow. In the other hand, she was dragging along a little three-year-old who occasionally touched a foot down in the airport as he went along. 
and she had her thumb stuck out and her purse was hung on that. Now that was the scene. And just as they whipped past me, I heard him say to her, well, did you bring the piano? And she said, uh, now let's not get smart about it. And he said, I'm not. The tickets were on it. <laughs> the, the, other, the other traveling story I'd like to share with you has to do with, the, with a train ride. You have to understand how the people were seated. The, uh, the new configuration on a train is to have not all the seats looking forward, but to have one pair looking forward and then the one facing that and so on down the line. Well, in this particular case, this was the seating arrangement of the four people. The, uh, the colonel of the Marine Corps was sitting next to the window, looking forward as the train went down the track, absolutely spit and polished from head to toe. You could see yourself, uh, your image in his shoe toes. Alongside of him was a fairly well-dressed, but no competition for the colonel, a young man who was in the Air Force and was a corporal. Facing the colonel and looking backward and sitting by the window was a strikingly beautiful young lady 21, 22, and next to her, facing the corporal, was a, an elderly spinster. And that was the arrangement when the train went in the tunnel and the electricity didn't work right and it went dark for a moment and there was this very loud kissing noise followed immediately by an equally loud slap. As the train pulled out of the tunnel, it wasn't clear entirely what had happened except that the colonel was the one that had been slapped because he had four red finger marks right down along the side of his face. And he was sitting there, still burning, sitting at attention, looking straight forward. And it was the thought in the minds of each that I wanted to share with you. The colonel thought that it was very clever of the corporal to crisscross over in front of him and kiss the girl and cause the girl to slap the colonel. The young lady thought it was a little strange that whoever did the kissing chose to kiss the elderly spinstress instead, but she didn't really mind. The older lady wondered to herself why it couldn't be her just once in a while, why it had always to be some young pretty thing that's receiving this kind of attention. The corporal had the final thought, for he thought that he might have been the only man in military history to have kissed the back of his hand, slapped a colonel, and gotten away with it. Now, I, I would like to report to you that the Farm Bill is done, that it has been voted upon, and the conference report is over, and it's gone, and it's a great bill. None of those things are true, so I'm not going to report on it in that fashion. The bill, in fact, is inadequate, probably the best you can get under the circumstances in Washington right now, but still quite inadequate. I do want to say that the parts of the bill which are creating most of the headlines are the least important. The smaller crops, the sensational battle over peanuts, important to peanut growers to be sure, but hardly the centerpiece of the farm bill. And the same would be true of the argument over tobacco price supports and the acreage allotment, I should say, since the money was taken out of the tobacco program, and the rest. In fact, I said at the outset that the program was inadequate. I don't want to, to damn it. I voted for it, and I'll probably vote for it again, holding my nose uh, while I'm doing so, uh, because the alternative of not having anything would probably be worse. In fact, there are a couple of provisions that I'm kind of happy to see there. One of them, which the NFO has been very, very active in seeking over the last several years, and Chuck Fraser does a very outstanding job for you folks down there. I digress only to say that it is rare in Washington lobbying and representing of organizations that you have someone who has that kind of respect and also that kind of knowledge in terms of what is possible, what is doable, and what the farmers across this country need and Chuck Fraser stands very, very high in my book and in the books of every member of the Agriculture Committee of both sides. <laughs> One of the things which you and I have been very concerned about over the last several years is the 
periodic in play, putting in place of an embargo with all of the concomitant events that, that follow that, that sequel, the destruction of the market, the sagging of prices, and the increase of competition somewhere else in the world, and usually the American farmer takes it on the chin. I know of no embargo in which it didn't work out that way, and the most recent one is just one more example. We have put in the bill, and I hope that this survives the conference, an embargo protection provision with 90% of parity assured on any commodity that was affected by a future export embargo, loan rates raised to the average price of the market for the 15 days preceding the embargo in case of a national security embargo. The second provision, which is there, but it's too bad that it's not funded, is the Commodity Credit Corporation rollover or revolving fund to finance some overseas exports and increases in sales. 